So this is last year. We moved our tote with Johnson Sioux materials into the bottom of our barn and put up a wall of straw bales around it and then two inch foam board on top to keep it insulated. We also made these small makeshift ladders on both the inside and outside to get in and be able to check the pile and we had a thermometer in there and we're able to keep it at 60 degrees. Initially we did try these heat lamps to keep it warm but this is Wisconsin and I had thought with you know the heat coming up through the barn floor and um, the lower portion of the wall which we left exposed you know that's around 50 degrees soil below the frost line you know is around 50 degrees and that that would help to keep it warm in there, but the heat lamps weren't enough enough at all. So we installed this, just set in a little ceramic heater on a block, and we also have a timer here for our watering. In terms of watering, we ran our drip, drip line. It turned out we had to kind of experiment with that and went back and forth, but eventually ended up, I think it was about 15 minutes every day was uh, enough for the drip line, which really kind of surprised me. I thought it would take hardly nothing, but we did need to run it, you know, like I said, 15 minutes every day. Um, by the way, I should mention, this of course is a very scary way to be heating that space. You know, we've got a ceramic heater here and straw and then water right next to it. Um, don't do that. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes compromises get made, and I definitely, this year when we set this up, I'm going to run all, I'm going to hard pipe this. Um, I'm not going to have a hose that can break, or, and, and in terms of the drip line, which I'll show you here, also the ceramic heater, we've got to come up with something different for that, um, maybe a heater that's outside the straw bales where we're blowing it in through some sort of um, sheet metal opening. I'm not sure what to do about that. This is all just sort of makeshift because, you know, we'll talk about this in a bit, but sorry, I'm starting and stopping the videos here. I wanted to show you the drip line. Um, this is all just makeshifts because the farm runs around 500 acres and if we do this in scale and this all works out, we're going to need, you know, at two pounds an acre, which I think is actually kind of light because, you know, you're never going to get compost perfect like um, David Johnson did and his wife H and Sue. So, you know, maybe you're running four pounds an acre, you know, even at 300 acres, you need over a half ton of this stuff, 1,200 pounds. So, um, yeah, this isn't gonna work to do in scale. There is a video out there um, of, a farmer, David West, he's out in Colorado. I'll put the link in the show notes that uh, did Johnson Sioux in scale in the winter of Col through the winter of Colorado using a hoop house and large square bales, straw bales to help insulate it and stuff. But yeah, the trouble with this drip line was that. Um, even though it was dripping, you know, the compost really doesn't absorb moisture that quickly. It starts to get fairly dense after a point. You can see how much it's actually gone down, maybe 18 inches in the tote total. And that's another sort of variable, depending on what materials you used. We used, you know, the bedding pack materials, which uh, are already partially broken down. Um, carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 30 to 1, according to my math. And then we also introduced wood chips. 
So, but the trouble with the drip line is that it forms little rivulets that just flow down through the vent um, openings, chimneys, or whatever you want to call them. You can see the sort of consistency of the compost. What was interesting with the worms was that we actually introduced red, wiggle, red wigglers early on, which is what you're supposed to do once it starts, once your pile cool, compost cools down to, you know, around EDF. And this video was actually shot at eight months, and we couldn't find one red wiggler in there. Now, someone said, you know, they ate through it and died, but it was loaded with these native earthworms that we have around here, just loaded with them. So that's always a good sign. And, you know, how, how they got in there, well, you know, we're scooping up material with the skid steers, so I'm sure some dirt got scraped in there. Um, I also want to mention that we did not initially cover the compost. So you can see we have this filter fabric on there now, which I pulled back so that I could show you the compost. But we did not initially cover it, and it was pretty cold by the time we got this in the bottom of the barn. And it was just starting to fire up. So, you know, it was August, I think it was, when we got that in there. And, uh, you know, no straw bales around it or anything, just set it in the bottom of the barn. And within two days, that, that pile blew out. So in other words, that pile was heating really nice, like it was steaming. And when we put it in the bottom of the barn, no sun on it, pretty cold. And those, all those vent pipes, or vent openings, I should say, or chimneys, whatever you want to call them, you know, you get a huge flow of air through there from the rising heat effect. And it was enough, it blew those piles, it blew that compost right out. I mean, it did not heat. And even after I went in, you can see I put in these <laughs> discs of cardboard, which, um, by the way, kind of get eaten away after a time to kind of choke it off and put this filter fabric on the top. It did not want to restart. So... Um, that was okay because it was already partially broken down. I wasn't too worried about it. Actually, the labs came back really good. Uh, I'll show you that in another video because I don't have those here right now. They came back really good, but in no way close to anywhere close. I think it was 15 times less total fungal count than the beam compost labs that you can find online. Still really high for compost, what um, typical compost, but nowhere near what the beam compost comes back or Johnson Sioux comp compost come back at, comes back at. So um, yeah, in the future, we're gonna make sure to keep that covered and I might even choke off those four inch openings for a time just to make sure that it the pile doesn't blow out again. Also, for sure, I'm gonna use smaller wood chips. We had some pretty large wood chips in there that of course aren't gonna get broken down, which is fine, but you know, smaller wood chips are going to provide greater surface area so we should get better fungal activity. Um, I also wanted to show you this Let this actually, I'm going to let this video run a bit just so you can see. By the way, this orange nylon deer fencing I've mentioned it before, but it did not work. I, I thought it would be plenty humid with the watering and enclosed that this really wouldn't be an issue of drying out. And I didn't want it to get too wet because you know, you get too wet, um, and you're going to go anaerobic so your pile's not going to smell good by the way this stuff interesting this stuff smells totally neutral like the compost they make on the farm the actively turned 
windrows, that stuff it will have a fungal, earthy smell to it. But this stuff smelled like, like I said, just like just about nothing, maybe a little bit of an earthy smell to it, which is what I'd expect actually, because when it's had eight months to be breaking down, a lot, you know, the microbial activity has died down and the fungal activity, you know, is reaching its end where the fungi have consumed a lot of what can be consumed. Now, like I said, there's larger wood chips and stuff like that in there. Here you can get a kind of sense of the putty-like consistency and also that it was a bit on the wet side. So just so that you can see that. Anyway, um, that deer fencing was too porous and it dried out a bit around the outside, but who cares? It was just a trial and we just wanted to see how it would do when we applied it as an extract. The last thing I want to talk about is um, application rates. Again, David Johnson and his wife, H. and Sue, recommends two pounds per acre. Although I have to say, you know, if you don't make really good, great compost and you may want to get a PLFA lab done on it so you can see what your t total uh, fungal count is. Although I have to say when you send it in there, you can expect to wait months to get the results back. So if you think you're gonna do that in spring and see how your compost is doing, you better give them a call and see if that's even possible. Um, but if you were able to do that and you could get a sense for how good your fungal counts were, you know, you could adjust the application rate, two pounds per acre, you know, is it when you're using perfect um, Johnson Sioux or what they call beam, B as in boy, E-A-M, compost. So then, you know, you just do some math. I mean, when you're doing an extraction, we were doing, we got a DIY extractor that we were doing into a 250 gallon tote. So, you know, if you're doing two pounds per acre, you use one and a half, five gallon buckets because it's about 35 pounds per bucket. And in terms of what you can expect from a tote of material, um, you know, we've heard that the compost will shrink down to uh, two feet. So, you know, if you fill up a 250-gallon tote, it's going to shrink down to two feet. Ours did not shrink down to two feet because, like I said, a lot of it was, it was already partially broken down from the bedding pack, and we had a lot of larger wood chips that didn't break down that much. So it's really pretty variable. But if you want to try and ballpark that, and you do the math, and you can read the math that I did there, you know, a, a tote, 250 gallon tote should be enough to do 150 acres. Although Jay Young from Young Red Angus Farms in the video, I got the link there below. It's in the show notes too. He was saying that, you know, he thought a 330 gallon tote would produce 700 pounds. So a little bit more than the 400 pounds that you would get doing the math that I did from above. But anyway, so that's what I have for my notes just to kind of give you a sense because the question always is how much of this stuff do we need to make to do a reasonably sized trial. So that's it for this video.